Hi, this is what Becky did last night and in today's video I'm going to do another Bird Crazy mini book and in this video I'll be showing you how I've made the backgrounds. So we're going for a Halloween theme this time which is my favourite time of year and here's the backgrounds we're going to make. So our first one is um, a graveyard scene. Our second one is going to be a full moon. Our third one is a broken down iron fence. And then we got a spooky dungeon. Then we've got a front door ready for trick or treaters. And then we have a spooky woodland. Okay. So there's our six different backgrounds. And what you're going to need for these is I've pulled out all the colours of Distress Inks that I've used in today's video and I have got in this stash use whatever colors you've got but I've got frayed burlap, pumice stone, black soot, walnut stain, brushed corduroy, spiced marmalade, forest moss, gathered twigs, weathered wood and antique linen and I have to say weathered wood because it's of the um, it's a blue grey so when you're doing your skies weathered wood is a lovely colour for these eerie sky colours. You're also going to need some stamping card. I've used um, some Sheena Douglas stamping card. You're also going to need um, ink tools to apply your ink. I have my lovely Carver corks which have got a twinkling H2O lid and the mini blending tool foam stuck attached to it. You're also going to need some, um, I've used a black fine liner pen, I've used some extra paper for cutting extra things out and inking up extra bits and this is just something I picked up in Hobbycraft, it's cham chamois or chamois cropping block, um, scissors of course, strong PVA glue of course. To do this one, I've used, I made a stencil from Doflex. So if you've got any Doflex or a piece of paper, piece of card, you can make your own stencil for a full moon. And I've used a giant Martha Stewart hole punch. Black card, so that you can get some nice silhouette shapes cut out for your scenes. Um, I've used an embossing folder and for this texture I've used uh, a, an embossing folder from Crafters Companion which has been put away so you'll see that later on in the video. Also I've used some metal jump rings for our dungeon here and on our door knocker. So these are just large jump rings that I had in my jewellery bit box but anything similar will do. And this is a stencil that I've used from one of Sheena Douglas's stencils, and it's the trees. Let's see if I've got it to hand. Yeah, I, I don't have the name of it, but it's this one here. But any kind of treescape stencil, or of course, you know, use this for inspiration. And if you're, if you like to cut card out, you could cut your shapes out for your trees instead. And that's basically it. So we'll get started and in the second part we're going to do our crazy bird stamping. So our first background is going to be our graveyard scene and each of these backgrounds are going to be 10 centimeters by 14 centimeters. So that's what I've trimmed down my stamping card to. I'm just gathering up some distress inks which I'm going to use and every single one of my backgrounds has been done with distress ink just from the pad. So for the graveyard scene, um, I'm going to do a sky which is mainly weathered wood and the ground is going to be a mixture of forest moss and gathered twigs. I'm using a piece of cut and dry foam here just to create um, a rough outline of the horizon in forest moss. And what's nice about this old piece of cut and dry foam that I've got is it's it's uh, very scratchy, so it gives a nice um, mysterious look to it. I ended up leaving two almost eye shapes 
in white left on the card, which is where I was going to put my mud mounds for the, for the graves. So here I'm going in with my round inking tool with a bit of gathered twigs and I'm just filling in that part. I'm then blending it into the forest moss around it. What I love about Distress Inks is how quickly you can really get a nice background done with very little work, very little effort. So that's the bottom done. And I'm just going to just blend in a little bit more with a bit more forest moss. So moving on to the sky, and this is where I bring in the weathered wood. Which as I say, I really liked using this colour for our spooky skies because it's it's from the grey palette, but it's also from the blue palette, so it gives a very dull look to the sky. And I'm not going to worry about meeting the um, horizon that we've drawn in already because when the sky meets the ground with the distress inks it gives it a really nice it's perfect for this because it gives it a very misty look to it because there's no clear cut horizon it just almost looks like there's a blanket of fog so here i am just making circular motions with my circular tool nice and easy and now I'm going in with a little bit of pumice stone. So pumice stone is uh, kind of a very pale brownie grey, I guess. And distress inks, they always look better in pairs. So if you're laying on two similar or contrasting colours, they go re very well together, whatever the colours are. So the next thing I'm going to do is just to give it a little bit more detail is I'm going to try and draw in a little bit of mist. So to do that I'm spraying some water onto a bit of kitchen roll and I'm just going to use that to pull across and to dab across the page to lift out some of that colour in wispy sections. There I go, pat pat pat. So I'm not looking for cloud formations with this, I just want something very subtle, just eerie, and I'm going across the ground as well. Put a bit more water on my uh, non-stick mat. I'm just going from a wet side of the tissue to a dry side to mop up the colour. There we go, so we're well on our way with that one. So the next step for this one is I'm just taking my chamois cropping block, which is just some random small cut paper that I got from Hobbycraft. I'm going back in with some pumice stone, round ink tool, and I'm just colouring a bit up. And that's what's nice about being able to cut out your own shapes, being a little bit brave about the shapes you want to create, and just layering it up, it's so, so easy. So this is going to be for the tombstones or the gravestones ready to cut out. So I've coloured it with just with pumice stone, in with the scissors, no dyes needed. If you've got nice posh dyes for gravestones then sure go for it, I bet it looks awesome. So there I'm having one of those arced tombstones and the next one's going to be a cross shape. So I'm just cutting off camera a little bit there, but you're, you're not missing out on much, it's really not. There we go, and now for the bottom, I didn't want to have a straight edge for the bottom because I want it to be part of the mud mound. So for each of these, I'm just cutting a curved bum for it, basically. 
And who doesn't want a curved bum? Alright, so now I go in with the black soot just around the edge and that's the difference between really making an object stand out and one that you know looks part part of the background this is going to make that item stand out a lot from the background and I'm not being totally even with it I'm trying roughly to get a bit more a bit more of the black soot ink where I think the shadows would fall because obviously they're 3d objects in real life but I'm not being too stressed about it I'm just cracking on with it So here are the uh, uni, what are they called? The pens that I use for doing fine lining work. So I'm just using it to chisel in RIP. So the pens I'm using, here we go, uni pin fine line. They're fairly, fairly economically priced over here. I'm going to go ahead and stick this down. This is my glue of choice. It's Cosmic Shimmer Specialist Acrylic PVA. It's very strong, dries very quick. I never have any, it, it's not watered down, so you never get any wetness through your paper. And it will stick a lot of stuff together. So I've popped those down and obviously I don't want them straight because as I always say with these, the style of the Bird Crazy stamps is it's very cartoon like and it's very abstract anyway so anything that's not straight will be fine. Right so I'm going back in with a bit more of the brown ink that I use, so Gathered Twigs I believe and I'm just using that curved tool just to try and get right up to that curved edge of the tombstones to make a nice big um, concerted effort to turn it into something that's part of the grave. And because it's a round tool and I've got a round curved edge that I've cut out of those bits of card, it, it just is so easy to do. And then the last step on this one is I'm just going in with a wee bit of uh, forest moss because I decided I just wanted a little bit of moss creeping up those tombstones. I want them to be really old. And there we go, that's first background done. So here we come on to our second background, which is going to be the full moon. It's a very easy and very simple, but very effective and striking background this. This is the dough flex I was telling you about in the introduction. I've got it in A4 sheets, and I've literally just taken my giant Martha Stewart circle hole punch and cut out a circle. I'm gonna use both parts, but I'm just gonna trim out the negative space and stash away the rest of the dough flex for another project. So here's our background card. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stick down the circle and that's essentially going to mask out the circular area for the full moon. So what then I can color in the background, so the sky behind it. Here's what I'm using to stick it down. It's Crafters Companion Stick and Spray. You're supposed to give it a very good shake first. Um, I'm doing this under my table completely naughty you're supposed to either do it outside or if you've got a custom spray box but I just thought I'd do it under the table to you know save a little bit of a trip and I'm just giving it a light spray on one side and then you leave it a few a few seconds it says 30 seconds on the tin to go tacky I'll be honest I did do something wrong I don't think I shook up the tin very well because I ended up with a little bit of residue left on my card but it came off so easy and I'll be honest, I haven't seen the demonstrators on TV when they use this. I've never seen them have to wipe off um, ex excess residue. So I think it was something I did wrong where I was rushing. But it didn't cause any smudging or anything, so it really didn't bother me. And even if it did, I probably wouldn't go away and do another one. I'd probably just blend it in. Here we go. So black soot coming in from the outside, so I've got the darker sky the furthest away from the moon and then I'm coming in in the circular motion coming up to the moon and then going over that template slightly 
If you don't have bow flex, you can always do exactly the same with card. You don't need to have the stick and, stick and spray. It certainly made it easier. Wow, I'm going really fast here. Look at me go. <laughs> right, okay, so here we go. So I've tried to get an even nice look, but that is so easy to, when you've got a nice card to work on, a nice inking card, then blending and getting even saturation is, is really easy. But again, so I've left it ever so slightly lighter towards the moon. And you'll see how that affects. It gives it a really nice glow in the sky. And because it's black, I, I don't normally dry in between when I'm working with distress inks if there's no water involved. But I just wanted to dry it off a bit because I really wanted to try not to get any black on my moon. So that's dried. I've wiped off the excess residue. I've taken away our template. And now I'm going in with the negative. So really easy to line up. This has also got a bit of stick and spray on the back. Stick and spray, if, you, if you've never used it before, is repositional adhesive. So it's excellent for stencils, masks, templates, that sort of thing. Now I know that I took a little while. I was umming and ahhing what colour to use for the moon. And in the end I decided to go for antique linen. You'll see me playing around and that's you know sometimes you don't need a plan sometimes you just need to think well I don't know what color to use so let me just try out a couple of colors and then decide then and also I then found that the the miniature ink tools that I have because I've already used them none of them are pale enough anymore to be suitable for using a pale ink so they were all coming out really dark So I had to change tactics again and I end up going for a large round tool again and well larger but of course that's what we're calling the mini tool. There we go. So with my sponge to get a little bit of a different texture I use it like a sponge and I dab, I press down. I don't rub, I don't blend, I literally just press down and I get a very, very soft sponging going on. Then I decide to go in for a little bit of roundness to make it a bit more spherical. Haven't changed my colour at all. And of course, what I've got in mind for this background is to have a lovely, um, we've, we've, got a, we've got a broomstick in the Crazy Thing stamp set, and I can just see a little bird going past this moon on his broomstick. Another thing I think I might do is I've got um, the stickles glitter and there's one called Stardust and I'm thinking of just putting a few stars in the sky when I come to put my birds on for this one as well. Okay, I seem to have disappeared so hopefully I'll be back soon. Where have I gone? Oh, I've got a hand. There we go. Oh, I think my postman came. That's where I went. Okay, so I'm back and I'm just going in with a bit more colour coming in from that one edge around there to give it that 3D appearance. So, of course, if you look at the moon, it's very rarely will it just look like a flat disc. What's nice about this using the positive and the negative of the dough flex is, of course, it has a certain thickness to it. And I'm not going right up to the edge of it because of the thickness. So when I remove this template, I get this lovely white glow around the outside of the moon as well. So we're we doing this now, we're taking that off. Big reveal. Oh, look at that. Absolutely smashing. And you can just see how that's glowing. Excellent. Okay, third background. This is going to be with our iron gates. So I'm making a sky. 
this is using weathered wood again like I said before this this turned out to be my favorite sky color for our Halloween theme just taking it really rough I'm not even you know this is going to be so um, I don't know how to describe it so distressed looking that I'm not even trying to blend the colors in and for the moon and the ground at the bottom I'm going for forest moss and again I'm going straight up to the edge I'm blending the two the sky and the ground together which is something I don't normally do but it really gives it a lovely misty look as if we're covered in fog What am I going to go for next? Ah, right, so this time I'm spraying water onto my mat and I've got a very fluffy brush here and I'm streaking the water across. So it's almost like I'm painting on horizontal lines of water. This way I can then take my tissue, my kitchen roll, and I can soak up even more of the colour to give even more of a harsher, misty fogginess. And I'm just going in a little bit more. I've done it once and I think, oh, I like that. I'll, I'll go, go in, make that a little bit more prominent. There you go, bit of a pat, pat, pat. Black card. So I remember buying this from um, Create and Craft and I think it was on one of Sheena Douglas's shows, which would mean that I think this is Crafter's Companion's black card. And all I've done is I've literally just trimmed the littlest slivers. I've not measured it, of course, because life's too short. So I just did it by eye, really. Used the guideline on it and just try to get them roughly even. I'm sticking down two horizontal lines. I'm, I am slightly overlapping on that first side, just so that I can trim it down flush to the card getting them roughly parallel but I'm really not that bothered about getting it perfect because it, they could be coming towards you and therefore they wouldn't be running parallel anyway. Depends how you're looking at it. So with the rest of those I'm going to trim them down into the little spikes for the fence. Scissors. Yeah, well, that's where I've been. I've been looking for the scissors. Right, here we go. Trim off my edges. Trim off the little ones. There they go. Then trimming off the big ones. And of course, those bits I've just cut off, they become my first targets to turn into the little spikes. And so to turn them into little spikes, I thought I could just put them on as they were, but they didn't look right. They needed to have a pointy top. So I'm literally just cutting out a really ridiculously tiny pointy, pointy spike to the top. And I do this with every single one. I'm not measuring them, as you can see. I'm just using one as a guide to cut the next one. Cut the point, trim it down. And then once I've done all these, I'm going to use my glue and I'm going to stick them down like a railing. And originally I thought I would just have a straight railing, but by happy mistake, I started to um, stick them down way too close together. So I completely misjudged how far the spacing should be between them for the number that I'd cut out. So I changed my tactic again. I could have made some more, could have cut out some more from the card, but now nah, I was on a roll. So that's roughly how far I should have spaced them out so that they all go along. But instead, as you can see, and I should have noticed straight away that I was putting them really close together. I'm not trying so much to get the bottoms to be in a straight line, but I am kind of trying to get those spikes at the top in a straight line because that's more where the eye is going to be drawn to. And of course, the ground's not going to be even, but if this was a well-made gate or a well-made iron fence, it's going to be fairly even at the top. 
So by this point, I realize, oh, I may not have enough. So let me start doing some from the other side. So there I come in and change my side I'm coming through. And I'm thinking, what do I do when I get to the middle and I've run out? And I think, well, what we can do is we can have a broken fence and that'll be even more spookier. So this last one, I just stick it down on the wonk. Ta-da, number three done. Oh, not yet, no, nope, sorry. Going in with a little bit of brown ink, that looks like gathered twigs again. And I'm literally just going all the way along the bottom of those railings to make it look like they're attached to the floor. And that includes going across the gap in between where there would have been some as well. There we go. I think also I must have just put a bit more of extra forest, forest moth down first to make it darker in the foreground. And there we go, number three. Here we go, background number four, and we are on a roll. No, not number four. Yes, number four. I've lost count. Okay, number four. Here we go. First things first, I want to get down a nice background colour because this is going to be our dungeon scene. And I just want a colour in the background because I'm going to do a little bit of paper tiling. So this is brushed corduroy going down. It's kind of the colour that I like to use for anything that's going to be cement in between bricks. And if you saw me do this technique on um, my previous Bird Crazy paper book, or picture book, shall I say, you'll see that I use the same sort of colour and the same sort of technique. This is the embossing folder that I got from Crafters Companion. It's one of their textures folders. Here's a scrap bit of paper. And before I put it through that folder and get it embossed, I'm just giving it a once over with a colour here. It's one of the browns and from a distance it's hard for me to see which brown that was. I think it was frayed burlap. So I've just done ink straight to card and again because it's all going to be embossed, it's all going to be cut out and then there's going to be extra colours put on top. I'm not too worried about it. The next colour I'm going to go and add to this is forest moss. Because, of course, if it's a dungeon, we are going to have mossy bricks. Right, so I've coloured it in, I've given it its base coat, and I go and stick it through my grand calibre and get it nice and embossed. Now I've come back, you can't quite see it yet, but now when I go off and get the next colour that I'm going to put on top, which is going to be a darker colour, I'm going to go over the top and I'm going to catch all of those raised areas. This colour I'm using is probably walnut stain or gathered twigs. And I'm just, I'm not pressing down, but I'm just catching all of those raised areas. So now that's done, the next step, once I'm happy with it, is to get them all cut out. Because we're going for dungeon bricks and not nice, neat little building bricks like the last picture book we made, I'm just going to eyeball the size and I'm not going to have them all regular. So you can see me just trimming, I'm not even measuring, I'm just going roughly by some, some sort of reference point. I'm stacking them all up and I'm just cutting them with force going through that much paper with those blunt scissors but I'm just literally cutting them by force so that they haven't got straight edges and they are all different sizes. So here's my idea I'm going to layer them all up like this I'm going to build a brick wall to go along the back. 
but to do that the, the outside of the bricks all need to be inked up and that's probably the most time consuming part I'm taking a very dark brown here which I think is the walnut stain and I'm going around every single edge of these bricks you do get in a rhythm with it though so um, don't lose heart if you think gosh that's that's ridiculous oh I appear to have frozen oh and I'm back again gotta love this computer technology So it definitely looks like I'm having a, an excellent evening. It's worth it in the end to have that ink around the edge of each of the bricks compared to putting them down flat where you're going to see the raw paper at the core on the edges. Doing it this way, it does make a difference and it is worth it. So if it wasn't worth it, I totally would not do this. Little tip, just try and have everything within the space of your wrist rotation. There we go, I just stuck a paper clip down the end of the glue to get it going again. And I'm just lingering it up, I'm staggering. One on the edge, one overlapping. And of course, what makes this brick wall tricky is because the bricks are not equal size, I do need to do a little bit of jiggery pokery to get them all to fit. So sometimes they'll fit, sometimes they won't. I'll just have a little play around with them. Every now and then I'll trim one down if I'm stuck, if it's really big. But it's very effective, this sort of building up a brick wall. I know there's lots of texture folders or um, ways, other ways of doing a brick wall, but until you've laid the bricks down, I think that's the most effective way. For me anyway. Right. Come on, nearly there. You know, I could win an award with that brick laying. Oh, look at that. And here's what I made earlier. Fantastic. Speed brick layer. So here we go. Now I'm taking a bit more brown um, uh, distressing. I'm gonna. I want to say walnut stain, but I think this one's a bit more of the gathered twigs. So unless you can see it better than I can on my screen, I'm just going right up to the bottom of that brick wall because I wanted to make it quite clear that we've got a floor at the bottom there. It will be much more clear when we've got a lovely bird standing there, thinking what on earth is going on. Here's those uh, jump rings. That's the word I'm looking for. And I've got a nice Spectrum Noir here. It's brown grey number eight, but this could be your Ranger alcohol ink. Um, I'm not fortunate enough to have lots of those yet. My first priority has been to get all the inks in the ink pads. So I'm just colouring it in because of course it's metal, those jump rings. We've got a very dirty, grimy dungeon and shiny brand new silver hoops just wasn't quite cutting it for me so I've gone for turning them really dirty with a bit of alcohol ink but it could be sharpie pens it could be anything glossy accents one of my favorite products and will stick down all of those things that normal PVA glue won't stick down on your artworks so I'm just and it's probably hard to tell but I've actually put two dots down but I'm actually just sticking the hoop down on the top edge of the hoop. So I will be able to, in the next video, get a chain to drop through the hoops. But my next challenge is, of course, to find a nice old chain. Something nice and cheap that I bought once and then left in my car for a couple of weeks normally does it. Excellent, so here we go. Background number five, this is going to be our trick-or-treaters door. So one to just bring a little bit more colour into the situation. All of the dark backgrounds, I hope to bring in more colours more colours to our birds. Um, and I am very pleased to say that today my wilted violet turned up. 
so I will be having a wilted violet bed. This is going to be my door that I'm colouring in here. I'm using aged mahogany and I'm just getting slapping the, co the colour on. Again, this is going to be another papery layered up piece. So I don't need to worry so much about being artistically beautiful. I'm just going to cut the shapes out and stick them down. It's literally primary school all over again, basic shapes to try and make a little picture. And of course the backgrounds, when you put the birds on, and of course I'm going to go for those funny little puns that they say um, at the end. So when I've stuck all that down, the backgrounds are just going to be there for illusion. So in terms of, you know, whether I've got this door the right size and the stoop the right size, it doesn't matter. It's all fun. So this is going to be the stoop. It's just a long rectangle and this is pumice stone, which again is that brown grey, very nice colour. It's got some very good uses. Where have I gone? I seem to have fallen off the camera angle again. Ah, here we go. So I'm just colouring in. I've cut the shapes out and I'm just colouring them in. Oh, I think I'll put that one there. Didn't have any cats interfering in this video. I kind of missed them about halfway through. Thought, why hasn't anyone jumped up onto the table and ruined my video? But no, it didn't happen. Maybe they're learning. OK, there we go. So there's my door. I've also cut out a wee bit of rectangle there, which is going to be a letterbox, just to make it a little bit more obvious if I was in any doubt that that was a door. Putting a little letterbox on, being British, that for me has made it a door. Right, so now it looks like I've got my component pieces ready. Now I need to work on that background. Um, when I decide to come back from wherever it is I've gone. Oh, there we go. So here we go. Brushed corduroy, yet again, my concrete colour, go-to of choice. Just going to put it down the sides because obviously I've got a big door to stick in the middle, so I don't want to waste my good ink. Looking splendid. Here we go. Bit of paper doing the old rip edge, popping it down, and I bet you I go for forest moss to put some grass down. Oh, I did. I went for forest moss using that torn edge to go right up and ink this fabulous grass effect. I'm doing this all the way along. Blended. Here I come in with my lovely glue again, sticking me door down. There's the letterbox and there's the stoop. I don't know if we call those stoops, I think we call them doorsteps. All right, so there we go. Just trim the top of that door down. Then the final touch for that door is one more of those jump rings. Bit of glossy accents. 
stick it down. I'm not colouring this one because this is going to be a nice house. But they're going to have a shiny door knocker. There we go. You know, I do feel sorry for the postman when people put their letter boxes at the bottom of their door. It's a long way down. Here, now this is my first sneak peek of one of the crazy things stamps because I decided that I did want to, in this video, stick a jack-o'-lantern or a pumpkin, we call them, on the doorstep here. And clearly my calculations of where the camera can see is very off, but I am actually using Ranger's archival black ink just to stamp it onto a piece of paper. And then this is where I've gone in with the spiced marmalade. And it's literally today I found out that he's just released the carved pumpkin colour, which of course, if you are, if you have the luxury of getting hold of carved pumpkin, then that would be a, probably a better choice to colour in your pumpkin. Now to turn this loot bag into a pumpkin, I'm just cutting away the handle and also it had a bit of a base to it as well. So I just cut those two things off whilst I'm cutting it out. And there we go, that's gonna go there. Little bit more glue, stick it down. And Bob's your uncle. There we go, background number five, nice. Okay, last one. This one was fun to do. Uh, I liked the way this one came out actually. Um, I'm looking at it right now thinking that it does need something else adding. So for the next video, I'm gonna have a think about what it is. It needs some sort of texture or some sort of fascinator thing added to it as well as just the bird. So when I come to the second part, I'll have a little think and see what I can do to this. But as it is, I like the effect and I can see this being a really splendid background for art journal pages or autumnal cards that you may be making. So I've gone over the whole thing with forest moss. This is again where my, I think what happened by the time I did this is I must have been getting a bit of fatigue because my arms, the length of my arms has quite clearly shrunk and they've retreated back into their elbow sockets and the shoulder sockets. And that is why I don't seem to be able to reach the actual position of the camera on my table. But what I'm doing here is I'm using this, this stencil by Sheena Douglas. I'm using gathered twigs and I am literally just putting this through. I'm, I'm shifting the, the, the stencil around. And that was important for me because it's got a very straight edge on the bottom. And if I did that and then put a bird on top, he would just be floating mid horizon and not have nothing to stand on. So I thought I'd mix around because I've used the stencil a few times now. So I want a little bit more for my money. So I've started to just in this background, pick out individual trees and have them at different levels growing out of the ground. And all I'm doing is I'm just going back in where the gaps are on the stencils just to have the whole, trink, uh, whole trunk a continuous thing. A little bit more of that same ink along the bottom to come up to the bases of those trees to give it a nice sturdy forest floor. Also, because I put that um, forest moss on really unevenly, it's given it a really organic look to it. Almost very camouflage. Yeah, this sort of background would do well for a nice military theme, I think. So a bit more forest moss just to fill in any any sparse areas that need a bit more colour. But I like that. I really like the perspective. So there we go. All six done. So there's our forest. There's our trick or treaters door, our spooky dungeon, our broken iron gate, our full moon, and our graveyard. So thank you for watching, stay tuned, and I hope you enjoy part two. So subscribe and you'll see it when it comes out. Thank you.